So uh, good afternoon. Yeah. Welcome everyone to our uh, LCAP lecture. Uh, welcome also to the people uh, who are also online. It's a big pleasure and an honor for me to uh, be able to uh, host uh, Professor Anne Shepherd, who is a professor of Royal um, College, College in London, and to Faith and she is well known. Her book on the fifth and sixth essay of the Republic Commentary on Progress, the first book, I think, opened up a new field at a time when not many people were studying progress. And many people have read that book, and uh, it has led to uh, lots of other studies by that's inspired by people to work on uh, similar topics. So, her interest is. Or part of your interest is indicated by the, by the book, by the topic of that book, so the relation between poetry, literature, and philosophy. Um, so she has worked a lot on Neoplatonism, but also on Plato himself, on aesthetics, Plato. Uh, she's published several books, um, many, many articles, too many to, to mention, but um, I've seen that there's now four coming a uh, commentary on eat archetypes of evils. So I look forward very much to see that as well. And uh, so uh, without further ado, uh, even before now is the time to talk for today is to create some issues in the latest for Peter. Well, thank you very much, Jan, for the for the introduction, and thank you all very much for inviting me to come and speak here in Leuven. I hope everybody can hear me and that everybody in Zoom can hear me all right. So, discussions of ethics in later ancient philosophy often contrast metriopatheia as the Aristotelian ideal with the Stoic ideal of apatheia. Aristotle, it's well known, argued that virtue lies in a mean in which the right amount of emotion is felt at the right time and in the right way. And he contrasted his view with that of unnamed others who held that the virtues were apathei. So there is a handout, which I hope you have copies of, and I, I guess that's been put in the, in the chat in, in Zoom, um, or it's being made available. Anyway, so the references for this bit of the paper are at number one on the handout. Um, you can see the references to the places in the Nicomachean Ethics and the Eudemian Ethics, where Aristotle mentions people, we don't know who they are, um, who held the virtues of apotheai. And there's some comments about this in Richard Sarabji's book on emotion and peace of mind. But by the time Dante's Laertius stated Aristotle's position as being that the wise man was not exempt from all passions, but indulged them in moderation, and again, that's on the handout at number one. I put the Greek there, ton sophon apathe men meenai metriopathe de. So he's making that contrast between apathe and, and metriopathe. So by that time, apathe had become the label for the Stoic position. In Neoplatonism, the contrast between metriopathe and apathe is used to distinguish civic or political virtue, politike arite in Greek, from purificatory virtue, cathartike arite in Greek. So the contrast between these two ideals becomes part of the distinction between two levels in what became an increasingly complex scale of virtues. Now, the Neoplatonists were not the first to transform the contrast between metriopatheia and apotheia into a hierarchical distinction. A similar presentation of the distinction is already found in Clement of Alexandria and also in Philo. And there's a very full treatment of this, very helpful treatment in the book by Salvatore Lila about Clement of Alexandria. So I've got the reference there at number two on the handout. Um, I should say there's a bibliography at the end of the handout with the um, fuller explanation of some of the references. I thought that was the right way to do it. So it's pages 99 to 111 in Lila's book. Um, so it's clear from the evidence that Lila's assembled that Clement associates apathe with the Platonist ideal of homoiosis theo likeness to God, taken from the Theaetetus 176b, in a way which clearly foreshadows the Neoplatonist view of apatheia. In this paper, I should look, <coughs> excuse me, I should like to look more closely at what the Neoplatonists meant by apatheia and by purificatory virtue, 
And I'm going to re-examine some key texts on this issue from Plotinus, Ennead 1, 2, that's number 19 in the chronological order, from Porphyry, Sententiae 32, and from Marinus' Life of Proclus, chapters 18 to 21. I shall focus particularly on the role of actions and behavior in Neoplatonist purificatory virtue, and on the differences between Neoplatonist and Stoic apatheia, which are linked to the differences between Neoplatonist and Stoic accounts of the soul. So, starting with Plotinus, uh, and with Plotinus' distinction in, in Ennead 1 2, the, the 19th one in chronological order, between just two levels of virtue. As often in Plotinus, the treatise begins by addressing a problem in Platonic exegesis. And the problem is how is the exhortation to escape from a world which contains evils and to become like God, found in the Theaetetus at 176a to b, how is that to be reconciled with the account of the virtues offered in Republic Book 4? In describing those virtues as politicas in 121 line 16, Plotinus echoes the mention of ten demoticain kaipolitikain aretain in the Phaedo at 82a11 to b2, as well as the use of the phrase politicae andrea in Republic Book 4, 430c2 to 3. So if Plato presented the Neoplatonists with a problem here, he also offered the materials for constructing a solution. Since in the Phaedo in 67c to 69e, Socrates distinguishes between the ordinary understanding of the virtues based on a calculation of pleasures and pains and the true virtue attained by the philosopher who purifies his soul by practicing philosophy and paying no attention to bodily pleasures and pains. While in Republic 500 D, there's a similar distinction, so the distinction in the Phaedo, between demotic virtue and the virtue of the true philosopher. So, you know, if you're a Neoplatonist, then the way you proceed is by in solving contradictions between things in different Platonic dialogues, is to try and put them into some sort of structure. Um, Plato's giving them the materials to do that. He's, I'm not saying this is necessarily the correct interpretation of Plato, but you can see how those passages invite this distinction between two different kinds of virtue. Now, this isn't just a problem about Platonic ethics. It's also a problem in Platonic psychology, which is familiar both to us and to the Neoplatonists. The question, and again, it's a question still debated by interpreters of Plato, is how to reconcile the tripartite soul of Republic Book Four with the suggestion elsewhere in Plato, both in the Phaedo and indeed in Republic Book 10, 611, 612, that our true soul is the rational part only. So if we say that the rational part of the soul or the soul purified by philosophy has its own higher kind of virtue and that this is likeness to God, that's how the, the Neoplatonist way of dealing with this goes. You know, you, um, the Phaedo is talking about a higher kind of virtue and that for them fits in very nicely with the notion of homoiosis theo in the Theaetetus. If we say all of that, a further question arises as to whether we should say that God is virtuous in some sense. And in fact, Plotinus argues in the first chapter of 1 2, it's in lines 27 to 52, that God is virtuous only in the sense of causing virtue in others. He offers two analogies, saying, first of all, that fire is hot in the sense of causing heat in other things, and then mentioning an intelligible house and a sensible house built according to that pattern. And John Dillon has commented in his paper about uh, Plotinus 1 and 2, the, again, reference in number three on the handout. John Dillon has commented that, I'm quoting Dillon now, I discern behind this argument a particular application of a principle first enunciated by Thucippus, that something which is an arche for other things cannot itself possess in the same way the quality or qualities which it bestows upon its products. And there's also some rather good discussion of um, what the point, how to understand Plotinus on this in um, quite a recent paper by Ricardo Chiarodana, again, the, hand, the reference at number three on the handout. Well, I had thought that the topic of my paper did not have very much relation to the overall topic of Arche, which I understand is the theme for these seminars. And I asked uh, Jan Opsa about this, and he said, oh, that doesn't matter. Um, however, here's a little bit about Arche because it turns out that questions about Arche are nearly always present in Neoplatonism in one way or another. I mean, I think it is, in, I'm not going to say any more about Arche, but I think it is interesting that 
that's one of Plotinus's starting points. You know, how, how can you say that the, that the Arche, that God is virtuous? And he has a very characteristic way of trying to deal with that. In the rest of Ennead 1 2, Plotinus' main concern is not with Arche, but with the distinction between civic and purificatory virtues. While the civic virtues introduce order and measure, metron, into the desires and the pathe, the emotions or the passions, the purificatory virtues belong to the rational soul alone. At each level, we find the four cardinal virtues of the Republic, so <clears throat> wisdom, self-control, that's sophrosyne, courage, and justice. But at the higher purificatory level, wisdom is the soul acting alone without sharing in doctor opinion, Self-control is refusing to share in bodily emotions or passions. Courage is not fearing separation from the body. And justice is the unopposed rule of logos and noose in the soul. Um, so I didn't want to flood the handout with text. I simply put the reference there at number four. This is um, chapter three, lines 10 to 19 of um, Ennead 1 and 2. Plotinus emphasis, like that of Plato, is on how the rational soul can free itself from the body. Plotinus develops a theme of the purification of the soul at more length in Ennead 3.6, that's number 26 in the chronological order, in chapters 4 and 5, and especially in chapter 5, lines 13 and following, where he uses Phaedo 67c 5 to 6 to ask what is meant by catharsis and by separating the soul from the body. So those references are at number 5 on the handout. As commentators have pointed out, particularly uh, Barry Fleet in his commentary on Ennead 36, Plato's own account of purification in the Phaedo draws on a background of ritual purification and mystery religion with which his original readers would be familiar. So there's something in the background about ritual. Um, Plato's moving away from that. Plotinus is moving away from it. Plotinus seems to be leaving all that behind and to focus on intellectual or spiritual experience with no reference to ritual action. But as we shall see, ritual action reappears at a later stage in Neoplatonism in Marinus' account of Proclus' purificatory virtue. So, you know, I'll say a bit more about that later, but um, people often see the introduction of greater emphasis on ritual and the emphasis on theurgy in the later Neoplatonists as being some sort of move away from rationalism move away from the kind of approach you find in Plotinus. Well, that's true. Um, but I think from their perspective, you know, if they're reading the Phaedo, and perhaps they still know something about ritual purification and mystery religions, though they're so many centuries later, then they would have, they would, they wouldn't see this as unjustified. Okay, back to Plotinus for the time being. So in uh, 1, 2, chapter 3, lines 19 to 21, and now I've actually got the whole of the text 1924 um, at number six on the handout, because now the details of the text stop matter rather more. In those lines, we find not only the adjective apathes, along with the ideal of homoiosis prostantheon, likeness to God, but also the word diathesis, disposition. Um, so I simply um, took the lower translation and put it on the handout. Um, Armstrong, in fact, translates the Athos state. So he says one would not be wrong in calling this state of the soul likeness to God. Um, and you'll see if you look at the Greek that the word diaketai and indeed the word diathesis reappear in um, lines 23, 24. Um, Armstrong is again translating in terms of state. Why is the divine itself not in this state? It has no states at all. States belong to the soul. Okay. So the important point is that diathesis is Stoic terminology, as indeed commentators have noted. Plotinus goes on to explain the difference between the thinking, the not ain of the soul, and that of intellect later in the chapter by appealing to the Stoic distinction between the logos endiathetos and the logos prophorikos. So it's clear that the Stoics are very much part of the intellectual background of this chapter, and yet Plotinian apatheia differs from Stoic apatheia, in at least two ways. I mean, I should say part of the motivation for this paper was that I gave a, a related paper um, a few months ago at the Sorbonne about, um, well, things to do with, uh, it was partly about Neoplatonic civic virtue. And I talked about Plotinus 
and Apatheia, and uh, Jean-Baptiste Gourinat, who of course is a, an expert on uh, Stoicism, had invited me, he said, well, this isn't Apatheia, you know, how come? What's the time has been talking about Apatheia? Um, so, well, okay, how does Plotinian Apatheia differ from Stoic Apatheia? Well, first of all, as Flamand points out in the introduction to his French translation of the treatise, for Plotinus, Apatheia is not an end in itself. The true aim for Plotinus is contemplation of the intelligible. Secondly, and I think this is equally important, for a Platonist, emotions belong to an irrational part or parts of the soul. So in terms of the tripart division of the soul found in Republic Book 4, they belong to the epithumaticon and the thumos. Orthodox Stoics do not distinguish between rational and irrational parts of the soul. Stoics, if you like, before Poseidonius, don't make that distinction, but regard emotions as false judgments. So in Orthodox Stoicism, in, old, in the old Stoa, the Stoic sage achieves apathy by always judging correctly. Now, it's not the case that he has no feelings at all. I mean, this is a common, um, I suppose, popular misunderstanding of apathy. It's not that. It's not that the Stoic sage has no feelings at all, but he feels only eupathei, good emotional states. So he feels joy instead of pleasure, caution instead of fear, wishing, bulatis, instead of desire, and he doesn't seem to feel anything in place of pain or grief. He just doesn't, doesn't have any dealings with pain or grief. For Plotinus, on the other hand, apathy means having the irrational parts of the soul so well under control that they don't disturb the rational part in any way. And this is all developed by Plotinus in chapter five of Ennead 1 2. And I put quite a large chunk of text here, lines five to 21, on the handout at number seven, because um, this is quite important for what Porphyry and then Marinus do. So I think I'm just going to read the translation of that. Um, again, I simply put in the lower translation and then um, I realized actually this morning that perhaps I should have adapted that a little bit and I'll, I'll explain particularly why I thought I should have adapted it as I go through. So here's the translation. We might say that the soul draws together to itself in a sort of place of its own away from the body and is wholly unaffected, so there's apathes I think, and only makes itself aware of pleasures when it has to using them as remedies and relief to prevent its activity being impeded. It gets rid of pains, or if it cannot, it bears them quietly and makes them less by not suffering with the body. It gets rid of passion as completely as possible. Now, that's Armstrong translating the word sumon, not unreasonably, because um, in terms of Plato's three parts of the soul, the thumos is where a lot of passions or emotions are located. But of course, thumon can also, thumos can also mean anger. Um, so maybe that's what it means here. Gets rid of passion or anger as completely as possible, altogether if it can, but if it cannot, at least it does not show its emotional excitement. And in the Greek, that's me gun out in sunogidzomenein. So again, I, that would normally be taken as referring to anger. And you'll, you'll see why I want to make that important later on. Um, so it doesn't share the anger. The involuntary impulse belongs to something else and is small and weak as well. So involuntary here is aprohyraton. So again, Plotinus is being a bit, well, not exactly Aristotelian here, but I take it he's got Aristotelian prohyrosis in mind. So Aristotelian prohyrosis is very much tied up with what you do if you're being rational about virtue. If something's aprohyraton, it's operated at irrational level. It does away with fear altogether, but it's nothing to be afraid of. So involuntary impulse, aprohyraton, comes in too, except that is where fear has a corrective function. Plain enlucitase, and again, we'll come back to that word later. What about desire? It will obviously not desire anything bad. It will not itself have the desire of food and drink for the relief of the body, and certainly not of sexual pleasures either. If it does have any of these desires, they will, I think, be natural ones with no element of involuntary impulse in them. Or if it does have other kinds, only as far as it is with the imagination, which is also prone to these. So um, I think it's I think it's fairly clear then that, as I said, apatheia is a matter of having the irrational parts of the soul very well under control. You just have these occasional aprohyrid, these involuntary impulses. 
there's nothing in this text to suggest that there are Neoplatonic equivalents to eupathei, but Plotinus does use, use the word eupathei of mystical experience in another treatise, Ennead 6, 7, 38 in the chronological order, chapter 35, line 26. Um, he's more likely taking the word from Plato, who uses it in the Phaedrus in 247d and also in Republic 10, 615a from the Sto than he is from the Stoics. And I put those references at number eight on the handout. Um, but I'm going to say a little bit more about Neoplatonic eupathei or Neoplatonic use of the word eupathea, let's say, and how they might relate to apathea towards the end of the paper. Okay, so much for Plotinus, at least for the moment. I'm now going on to Porphyry. In Sententiae 32, Porphyry picks up on Plotinus' discussion of the virtues in Ennead 1 2, and he interprets Plotinus' distinction between civic and purificatory virtues in such a way that those two levels of virtue expand to four. Porphyry begins his account with a paragraph about the virtues of Politikos, which lie in Metriopathea, before going on to a considerably longer discussion of the virtues which he says are called purification, catharsis. These, he says, belong to the person who is making progress towards contemplation. So I'm now getting into the text, which is at number nine on the handout, uh, the top of that bit um, from Sententia 32, lines 15 to 32, you'll see he talks about virtues which are to pros theori and prokoptontos, that of the person who's making progress towards contemplation, and these virtues consist in detaching oneself from the things of this world. Um, the end of that passage that I put on the handout, so it's line 29 to 32, he sums up the contrast between these two levels of virtue. At this point, he calls the higher virtues contemplative, he calls them theoreticas, that's in the second last line on the handout, and he associates them with apatheia. Um, and I'm going to say a bit more about those final lines of the passage a bit later on. Later in the chapter, Porphyry describes two further levels of virtue, and what he's doing is interpreting chapter six of Plotinus Ennead 1 2 as implying these. The third level in Porphyry has no specific name for, name for uh, in his view. It's the level at which the purified soul acts intellectually. So this is, um, I just put a tiny bit of this at number 10 on the handout. This is lines 55 to 57 from Sententiae 32. Um, third kind of, of um, third class of virtues, which are not a rose tape, suches and aguses, the soul acting intellectually. And he contrasts these with what he, the purificatory and civic virtues. So the lower two kinds, task cathartikas, politicas. And then Porphyry has a fourth level, that of the paradigmatic virtues. And at each of these four levels, the four cardinal virtues of the Republic reappear, defined in ways appropriate to that level. Now, other scholars have discussed how Porphyry finds his third and fourth levels of virtue in Plotinus' text, and how they're further elaborated in later Neoplatonism. I'm not going to talk any more about that, except just to point out or to explain that the name contemplative, theoreticos, which is used by Porphyry for his second purific purificatory level, later becomes a chapter third level, which in Porphyry has no specific name. So that's potentially a bit confusing. When you get to Marinus or indeed to Olympiodorus or Damasius, they're using the term contemplative theoreticos of the third level. That's not actually what Porphyry is doing. But my concern is with the second, the purificatory level of virtue, and with the same two issues as I discussed earlier in relation to Plotinus, namely, first of all, the role of actions in behavior, and secondly, the difference between Neoplatonic and Stoic notions of apatheia. So like Plotinus, and indeed like Plato in the Phaedo, Porphyry emphasizes that the purification involved in the second level of virtue is a matter of detachment to the body, without being very specific about how such attachment might be facilitated. But he does refer in line 16 to 18 of Sententiae 32, this is actually, again, the beginning of the passage, it's at number nine on the handout. He refers to um, apoche, apoche ton meta to semitos praxion. So in the translation, um, abstention from actions in concert with the body and abstention from, I'm going on the English now, participating in the passions, in the path, um, 
in the PAPE, the sympathei that affect it. And that reference does perhaps suggest that there might be some specific behavior involved. So again, uh, Ricardo Chiarodana in the same paper that I mentioned before, um, takes it that this is, these, are actually, these lines actually refer to the practice of vegetarianism, which of course Porphyry was, was very keen on. That's what the De Abstinentia is, I was gonna say all about, that's a bit quick. Um, but the De Abstinentia is advocating vegetarianism. So maybe that's right. And if so, then it's not just a matter of, um, as it were, sitting and having the right kind of thoughts and trying to detach your soul from the body, separate yourself from the body in that sort of way, there might also be some actions involved. Again, like Plotinus, Porphyry uses Stoic terminology in his account of purificatory virtue. So again, I'm still now with the passage at number nine on the handout. And at the beginning of that passage, I've already mentioned this phrase that he has, to press the proof to pros theori and prokoptontos, the person who's making progress towards contemplation. Now, prokopton is a Stoic term, and the Stoics use this to describe the person who's not yet a sage, but who's making progress towards becoming one. Porphyry's use of that word here brings out that for him, as for Plotinus, purification is only one stage in progress towards the ultimate aim of contemplation of the intelligible. And indeed, the fact that Porphyry reads Plotinus as separating the purificatory stage from those which follow only reinforces that point. Okay, so far, so good. Um, but then uh, an orthodox Stoic reader of Porphyry would be very surprised by lines 29 to 32 at the end of that passage that's on um, the handout at number nine, because if you look at that, um, well, or indeed even earlier in the passage, Porphyry is associating apathy with purificatory virtue. Um, of course, for the Stoics, you're not apathy if you're prokopto, and you're not apathy if you get to be a sage. And then when you get to lines 29 to 32, which I uh, jumped over a bit earlier on, this is the end of the passage in number nine, but then there's something, um, something quite odd going on here. If you look at those last few lines, hey men un capitas politicus aritas diapasis en metriopathea theoreta. Okay, so um, the disposition and the translation, the disposition and characteristic of the civic virtues is to be seen as the imposition of measure on the passions. Okay, but tell us hecusa tod zain hos anthropon kasafusin, it has in its same living a human life in accordance with nature. Well, that in various different versions is the usual stoic account of the telos. Hey, the Cantatus Theoreticus in Apatheia. So the disposition that results from the contemplative virtues, which remember for Porphyry, the purificatory ones, is in Apatheia, in detachment from the passions in Dylan's translation. Hey, tell us, hey, prostheon homoiosis, whose aim is likeness to God, which of course is, you know, the phrase from the Theotetus, the Platonist aim. So, um, and it's quite interesting, before us anything else about it, um, it's interesting that he's picking up, because the notion of homoiosis proston play on there. Um, there's a big French edition of the um, Sententiae by a whole team uh, who were being directed by Luc Brisson, and um, different chapters of it are, or different sections have been commented on by different people. So the people who did the notes on chapter 32 are Brisson and Jean-Marie Flamand, the man who did the French translation of the Sententiae. And in their note on this passage, they point out this is the only place in Sententiae 32 where Porphyry picks up on this phrase from the Theaetetus. And the notion of likeness to God is very important in Plotinus Ennead 1 2, um, and indeed in 1 8, which, is, as Jan mentioned, I have a, a commentary on which I hope is going to be published when Parmenides Press get around to it. Um, anyway, this is the only place in Sententiae 32 where Porphyry mentions homoiosis theo. But I think that probably shouldn't be overemphasized because the phrase is quite common elsewhere in Porphyry, especially in the De Abstinentia, where as here it's associated with apatheia. Okay, so just to remind you that Plotinus had introduced the distinction between civic and purificatory virtue as among other things, a way of resolving the contradiction between the emphasis in Plato's Republic on virtues which involve all three parts of the soul and the impression given by the Fido that true virtue is a matter of turning away from the body to practice philosophy. Porphyry is going a whole lot further 
he's using the distinction between civic and purificatory virtue as a way of trying to fit both Aristotelian and Stoic ethics into an overall picture which remains fundamentally Platonist. So the Aristotelian approach to the emotions, metriopatheia, and the Stoic telos, living in accordance with nature, are being slotted in at the level of civic virtue, while the Stoic approach to the emotions, apatheia, and the Platonist telos, likeness to God, are placed at the level of purificatory, or as he calls it, contemplative virtue, which is itself only a stage in the progress towards still higher virtue. So, as I say, if you're trained in sort of a kind of compartmentalized idea of different philosophical schools in antiquity, this is pretty surprising. As I mentioned at the beginning, apathy is already associated with homoiosis Seo and Clement of Alexandria. And in fact, Clement also associates the stoic telos of living in accordance with nature with metriopathia. So I think Porphyry's synthesis might have been much less of a surprise to his ancient readers than it is to us, since by his time, the theories of the old Stoa had undergone various adaptations and transformations. The fact remains that what Porphyry means by apatheia is what Plotinus meant by that term. And so it's not really the same as what the Stoics meant by it. As I've already said, Porphyry is very clear that apatheia and purificatory virtue are not the ultimate aim, but a stage along the way. And Porphyry, like Plotinus, subscribes to a Platonist psychology, according to which the emotions belong to the lower irrational parts of the soul, rather than being false judgments, as they are for Orthodox Stoics. Uh, and again, just to stick with this passage from Sententia 32 that I put at number nine on the handout, uh, in the middle of it, about nine lines down, you can see that he's describing Sophrotune, self-control, about eight lines down, I'm sorry, you can see that he's describing Sophrotune as being, um, at, at the purificatory level, of being tome homopathane. And that means something like not consenting to any of the passions. I think, if I remember correctly, Dylan actually translates it as not assenting to any of the passions. And I thought, well, hang on, that, you know, assent is a stoic notion. I, that seemed a bit too stoic to me. So I would rather translate it as not consenting to any of the passions. So it's not homopathane. And Plotinus uses the word homopathate in, um, that's not on the handout, but in any one, two, three, in line 16. So again, I think he's thinking of this in the same way as Plotinus, the pape belong to lower parts of the soul. And if you're at the level of purificatory virtue, then you're not um, consenting to any of those. Brisson and Flamand comment that the fundamental idea here is that the passions cannot disappear completely from a soul which remains associated with the body. So presumably from Porphyry's perspective, the lower parts of the soul are always wanting, as it were, to intrude on the rational part. They're trying to drag it into the experience of passions, but the soul which has purificatory virtue will resist this as far as it can. And this theme is developed further towards the end of Sententiae 32, quite a long passage, which I, is too long to put on the handout, in lines 95 to 127, in a passage which echoes Plotinus Chapter five of Plotinus one, two echoes uh, lines five to 21 of that. Um, yes, I've just put a summary reference there at number 11, but in that quite long development at lines 95 to 127, Porphyry describes how the person of purificatory virtue will admit only necessary bodily pleasures, pains and desires, feeling no fear using sumos, so, anger, or maybe passion in general, if you take Armstrong's interpretation of Plotinus, and fear only for nuthetasis, only for correction or admonition. So he's echoing Plotinus there quite clearly. And these lines clearly assume a Platonist psychology. I think that implies a recognition that this kind of Platonist apatheia is not a complete absence of feeling, any more than stoic apatheia. But what it is, is trying to keep the feelings under control. I should also mention, although it, I don't quite know what to do with it, but I should mention the passage that I put at uh, number 12 on the handout uh, from line 60 to 61, where in Sententiae 32, where Porphyry uses the word apatheia in his description of courage at his third unnamed level of virtue. So just in the translation, courage is detachment from the passions, 
through which the soul assimilates itself to that towards which it turns its gaze, which is itself free from passions. So interesting. I mean, there's the notion of homoiosis again. Um, and that towards which the soul is turning its gaze is indeed presumably God, the arche, if you like, which is itself apathes. So that which, to which the soul is turning is complete is completely apathes. Um, courage at this third level is kind of apatheia. So it's, he's using it at that level as well as at the purificatory level. Presumably at Porphyry's third level of virtue, there's greater detachment from the passions than at the second purificatory level. But there doesn't seem to be any room, either at the purificatory stage of Porphyrian virtue or at this higher third level, for anything like the stoic eupatheiae. Okay, so now I come on to Marinus's life of Proclus. By the time Marinus wrote his life of his teacher Proclus, the scale of virtues has been further expanded at both ends. <clears throat> it seems to have been Iamblin who introduced natural virtue, Fusike Arise, and what I think is best translated as habituated virtue, Aethike Arise, below the level of civic virtue. And Iamblichus, in fact, was using distinctions made in Aristotle in the Nicomachean Ethics between Fusike Arise and Curia Arise, so between natural virtue and virtue properly so called. That's, uh, again, the references here at number 13 on the handout. This is in um, Nicomachean Ethics, six, book six, chapter 13, 1144b1 to 18. Um, and I think also, I think he's also drawing on Aristotle's account of habituation, which you get in book two of the Nicomachean Ethics, chapters one to four. Um, so that seems interestingly, that Aristotle seems to be part of the background for introducing these two lower levels. And then at the upper end of the scale, Porphyry's paradigmatic virtues, which are the fourth level in Porphyry, they're elaborated in various different ways by Marinus and also by Olympiodorus and Damasius in their commentaries on the Phaedo. So I'm not going to go into all of that. Um, if you want to see a very clear setting out of it, uh, the edition, the Bude edition by Sapre and Sagan of Marinus' Life of Proclus in the introduction, there's a very full account of the different versions of the scale of virtues, and they've got a nice table on page 82 of their introduction, which sets it all out. In Marinus' version, the paradigmatic virtues are replaced by two levels, labelled theurgic and higher than theurgic. So Marinus ends up with um, seven levels altogether. In the middle of the scale, the basic distinction between civic and purificatory virtue remains essentially the same as in Plotinus and Porphyry, but with some interesting differences, particularly in relation to purificatory virtue. In part, these differences result from the fact that Marinus is using the scale of virtues to structure a biography which despite its hagiographic tone, is at the same time an account of the life of a real person who behaved in particular ways and had a particular personality. <laughs> Marinus seems to have a little bit of a hard time when discussing Proclus civic virtues in explaining that he was ambitious, he was philotimos only for virtue and the good, and that while he was irascible, sumo edes, so thumos again with reference to anger, I think, he also calmed down quickly. I think it's really hard to tell whether those comments are about the real Proclus, if you like, or whether that too is traditional. I mean, Safra and Sagan in their notes on this passage draw attention to traditional Greek ideas about both philotimia and anger. The, the point being that, you know, certain kinds of philotimia, certain kinds of anger are okay, particularly at this lower level of civic virtue. But it's very tempting to see something about Proclus' real personality there. All the same. Similarly, when Marinus comes to give an account of Proclus purificatory virtues, and he spends really quite a lot of time on those, it's chapters 18 to 21 of the life, the considerable emphasis which he lays on Proclus' practice of ritual purification presumably does reflect the reality of Proclus' behavior. So according to Marinus, Proclus engaged in various purificatory rituals, some Orphic, some Claudian, including sea bathing. Marinus Quotes Plotinus Ennead 1 2, chapter 5, um, line 7 to 9, on the correct attitude to the necessary pleasures of food and drink, before explaining that Proclus ate and drank little and he was largely vegetarian. 
And of course, that same passage of Plotinus was the one that was picked up by Porphyry um, towards the end of Sententiae 32, specifically in lines 113 to 115. And Porphyry also is advocating vegetarianism. So this is the Plotinus that's at number seven on the handout and the Porphyry that I just gave you a very general reference to at number 11. So again, you know, presumably Marinus isn't making it up that, that Proclus was quite abstemious and largely vegetarian, but he wants to relate that to what's said about this by Plotinus and Porphyry. After these lines, which explicitly relate Proclus' practice to those his predecessors, Marinus goes on to describe how Proclus celebrated all kinds of religious rites in a way which sounds very unlike the practice of either Plotinus or Porphyry, but which links in nicely with Proclus' composition of hymns to a variety of deities, which indeed Marinus talks about at this point. In chapter 20, Marinus turns to Proclus' courage in the face of physical pain, his restraint of anger, Thumos again, and his abstention from the place of sex. So once again, his text combines partial quotations of passages of Plotinus 1, 2, chapter 5, at least one of which is also picked up by Porphyry in Sententiae 32, with what sound like actual biographical details of how Proclus behaved during his final illness. So I've put the whole of chapters 20 and 21 of Marinus on the handout at number 14. Um, you'll see that in the Greek, there are various quotation marks appearing. Um, well, I took it from the TLG, but who's using um, Masullo's text. Those are actually the, the quotations of Plotinus, and those quotation marks do make it very clear how much Plotinus is being echoed here. Um, and then I use Mark Edwards' translation for the English. Well, he doesn't actually um, pick out the quotations, so I didn't start fiddling with the translation and doing that. Um, if you look at, uh, again, if you look up the Bude, Safri and Sagan's notes set out very clearly the details of Marina's use of Plotinus and a little bit of use of Porphyry as well. Um, and chapter 21, which is also at number 14 on the handout, sums up Proclus' purificatory virtues in a paragraph which begins with language that's actually taken from the Phaedo, um, this business about the soul collecting itself from every side and gathering itself within itself. That comes from Phaedo 67C and 83A. Um, but chapter 21 is also filled with echoes of several different passages of Plotinus, Ennead 1, 2, and it firmly distinguishes between metriopathane and apathanes, associating the latter with purificatory virtue. Marinus' emphasis on ritual practice reflects the greater importance of ritual and, of course, theurgy in later Neoplatonism. At the same time, it's worth noting how closely Marinus links his account of Proclus' purificatory virtues with the accounts of these virtues found in Plotinus and Porphyry. So, again, I suppose characteristically for a later Neoplatonist, Marinus isn't claiming to be doing anything new. On the contrary, he's claiming that his hero, Proclus, is, you know, fitting in with um, virtues as described by Plotinus and Porphyry. We should also remember that the increasing acceptance of theurgy by Neoplatonist Ryamblichus onwards went together with changes in psychology. So if one believes, as Iamblichus and subsequent Neoplatonists did, that the whole soul descends and that action by the divine is needed to enable its return, if you believe that, then ritual practice becomes much more important as a way of purifying the soul and making possible its detachment from the body. We've seen that both Plotinus and Porphyry use Stoic terminology in their accounts of apatheia and purificatory virtue although I've emphasized that their understanding of apathy is very different from that of the Stoic. The Stoic background is far less evident in Marina, but it does emerge clearly in lines 17 to 24 of chapter 20, and that's the bit that I've put in bold at 14 on the handout, both in the Greek and in the English. So if I just read you the English, um, he maintained this impassibility. Well, that's, that's Mark Edwards' translation, fair enough, the Greek there's Hutos apathos diakato, right? He was disposed in such a, a, a way that involved detachment. He maintained this impassibility, not only toward the sufferings of his body, but even more toward external accidents beset him and happenings that seemed contrary to reason. Thus his response on each of these occasions was, things are as they are, things are as ever. 
So, okay, Apothos Diocator is very stoic sounding, but Marinus is also ascribing to Proclus the kind of attitude to external events recommended by Epictetus, um, notably in Enchiridion uh, section eight, that's just right down the bottom of that bit of a handout. Um, Epictetus saying, do not seek for what happens to happen as you wish, but wish for what happens to be as it happens and you will fare well. And there are other passages, quite a lot of other passages of Epictetus where he says similar things. And Simplicius, in his commentary on the Enchiridion, uh, develops this theme at some length. And again, you can find um, the references and some discussion in Sartre and Sedan's edition of Marinus. So, I mean, this is the kind of ethical stance which is very much associated with, well, I guess particularly with Epictetus, but with, um, you know, the Roman Stoics. One can recommend an ethical stance of this kind without taking on Stoic physics and metaphysics, as indeed you can see from its popularity in movements like Stoicism today. Okay, so modern people call themselves modern Stoics don't have any particular metaphysical commitments. Um, the Neoplatonists, by contrast, are firmly committed to their own metaphysics and indeed their own psychology, but they're able to incorporate the ethical stance recommended to those who are trying to attain the apothea of the Stoic sage within their own theory of the virtue. In attributing such a stance to Proclus as an aspect of his purificatory virtue, Morinus is, by implication, giving the same account of apotheia as Porphyry and Plotinus. So apotheia for him, as for Plotinus and Porphyry, is a kind of detachment from the body and from the lower parts of the soul, found in one who's progressing towards still higher virtue. In discussing Plotinus and Porphyry, I raised the question whether there's any scope in Neoplatonism for something like the Stoic eupotheiae, and I mentioned Plotinus' use of this word in connection with mystical experience. Richard Sarabji has pointed out that the word eupatheia is also used of intellectual pleasure by Damasius in his lectures on the Philebus. So this is the last reference on the handout. This is number 15 at the handout. Um, this is um, section 13, lines 5 to 12, and section 87, lines 1 to 4 of Damasius' lectures on the Philebus. So just by way of conclusion, it's worth asking about the place of mystical experience and intellectual pleasure in the Neoplatonic scale of virtues. Where would they fit in? In terms of the scale found in Marinus and also in Damasius' commentary on the Phaedo, intellectual pleasure would presumably be experienced at the level of the contemplative virtues. So in their terms, contemplative virtues are one up from purificatory ones. In Plotinus, things are less clear, since he offers only the basic distinction between civic and purificatory virtue. While we may not think that Porphyry was correct to interpret Plotinus as implying that there are also higher levels of virtue beyond the purificatory, it seems to me reasonable to suppose that for Plotinus, mystical experience falls outside his distinction of two levels of virtue. A bit tricky, because he's not talking about it in the same context, but I think it would fall outside and that in such an experience, the soul would be utterly undisturbed by the body in a way that goes beyond the apathia of purificatory virtue. So if this is correct, then while Neoplatonic apathia still allows some limited scope for feelings associated with necessary bodily pleasures, pains and desires, and for the judicious use of anger and fear, along the lines described by Porphyry at the end of Sententiae 32, and also in keeping with Marinus' account of Proclus' abstemiousness about food and drink, his restraint of anger and his abstention from sexual pleasure. So, okay, that's Neoplatonic apathia. You've got this very limited scope for feelings. If all that's correct, the feelings experienced by the Neoplatonist who has purificatory virtue are not eupathia, since the Neoplatonist apathist, unlike the Stoic sage, has not reached the highest possible level of virtue. So there's still feelings that, you know, ideally the Neoplatonist um, philosopher is trying to get away from. But I do think it's interesting that they occasionally, Neoplatonists do occasionally use the word eupatheia. And Neoplatonic, it looks as though Neoplatonic eupatheia are the, the feelings, except perhaps that's not the right word, but something like feelings experienced by one who's progressed beyond apatheia to a higher intellectual or indeed more than intellectual level. So, thank you. <laughs>